Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Hope you've all been doing well. In this video, I wanted to share some information I've recently obtained from a close source of mine in regards to AMD's upcoming Ryzen 3000 processors. I haven't really made any videos recently in regards to the rumors or leaks surrounding the 3000 series, mainly because I felt that most of the info out there was quite minimal and lackluster. For those of you who don't know, AMD actually has one of their head offices here in Markham, Ontario, which is very close to Toronto. There was an event that took place earlier this week where they had shared some information about their upcoming products, talked about their current position in the market, what's been accomplished, and what their goals are for the future. Usually when it comes to rumors, leaks, and information, I always say take it with a grain of salt. However, in this case, this information comes directly from AMD, so it doesn't really get any more concrete than that, I'd say. However, unfortunately, on a saturated platform like YouTube, you need an X number of subs to be considered legitimate. And why would anyone want to believe a guy with just 2k subs? So, just for the sake of it, take it with a grain of salt. Anyways, some of the information that was given I simply cannot disclose as it could potentially compromise the identity of the source, their position, and relationship with the company. At the event, most of the information we had learned in the past was more or less talked about, but there were some new interesting bits of imp information that I can share with you guys. For starters, when it comes to the release date of the third generation desktop processors, we were told, and I'm quoting exactly what was said here, back half of this year. When asked to elaborate on that, the same response was given and nothing else. So you guys can interpret that in any way you want. I personally think that we're going to be seeing some kind of announcement on their upcoming 50th anniversary. This is a pretty big occasion for them, and I would see it as a total missed opportunity if they didn't do something grand for the occasion. Then I also believe we'll be seeing some kind of launch around Computex with the processors hitting store shelves a week or so later. I personally don't think they'll wait until July to release the 3000 series. I think it would be a bit too late as Intel is also gearing up to release Comet Lake, which is another revision of their Skylake architecture, but with an addition of a 10 core processor to the lineup at Computex. In this case, I would expect an announcement of the Ryzen 3000 series with higher core count CPUs would completely dwarf anything Intel would have to show off. Earlier, I had mentioned at this event, they had talked about their current position on the market. One of the things that was highlighted was that for each sub-series in their competitors lineup, the Pentiums, i3s, i5s, and i7s, AMD had an answer for it. It was explained that any inquiries made in regards to an i5 for example, should also have a Ryzen 5 introduced in the conversation, as it offers better value in terms of core and thread count. i7s used to offer only 4 cores and 8 threads, while the first generation kicked off with the introduction of a similarly priced 8 core 16 thread processor. Of course, now Intel is also offering 8 cores on their i7 lineup for the mainstream, albeit without hyper threading, while an R7 2700 or 2700X also gives you 8 cores but with the simultaneous multi threading resulting in 16 threads. So you do get quite a bit more CPU headroom there. As for the i9s, of course, you could compare those against the Threadripper CPUs. Both Intel and AMD have those processors on their HEDT platforms. But with the release of the 9th gen, Intel brought an i9 to the mainstream platform. Although I don't know if the price justifies the description of mainstream. But nonetheless, it's on a mainstream platform. You can use it on a Z390, Z370, or B360 motherboard. Regardless, AMD don't really have any direct response to the mainstream i9. So when asked... If this topic alluded to an introduction of a Ryzen 9 which would compete with the i9 and could be compared to it, the response that was given was no comment. Obviously that could go either way, but I'm pretty sure we'll be seeing a Ryzen 9 3800X introduced into the lineup. The next thing I wanted to talk about was motherboards. Now if you guys recall from the first gen launch, the motherboards and their partners were just in an absolute state of mess. We were told that with the first gen, the motherboard partners had to rush boards out because of production issues, poor scheduling, and also because their partners really didn't have too much faith in AMD, which I was surprised to hear they even would admit that. And AMD were the ones actually chasing after their partners to ensure bo boards were manufactured adequately, and that to me is believable, because when the first Ryzen 7 CPUs had hit store shelves and stock was abundant, the motherboards were very scarce. I was calling all my local computer hardware stores every day, inquiring about stock, and had like three separate orders placed at three different retailers. Not only that, but boards were just plagued with issues, problems with the BIOS, 
memory incompatibility, and some people's boards just straight up bricking themselves. It was quite obvious the launch was rushed. However, this time around, they had happily expressed the situation was the opposite, and it's the motherboard partners who are constantly in touch with AMD to ensure their boards are right this time, and that the launch goes more smoothly. If AMD wanted, they could have probably released the third generation processors earlier, maybe in the first quarter of 2019, but they're most likely waiting on the motherboard guys. Hence the rumors we've heard from various sources saying X570 boards will be launched at Computex. Memory compatibility was also brought up, and they knew it was a major concern for all. And that with the third gen, they shouldn't have those same issues we saw with the first gen. Of course, we'll have to wait and see for that. Now, as for owners of older generation motherboards, X470, B450, X370, the upgrade will be as easy as just flashing the BIOS and dropping in the new CPU. However, B350 owners, and this is probably going to piss a lot of people off, B350 owners will not be getting the updates. So unfortunately for them, they'll have to upgrade their motherboards as well. At the time, they couldn't fully elaborate as to why B350 motherboards wouldn't work, but it had to do with older mid-range chipsets lacking support for the Zen 2 architecture. The other thing that they had mentioned was that the efficiency gains that they had made from simply going to 7 nanometers could not be expressed enough. Remember, the first generation Ryzen was released on Global Foundry's low power node, and the 12 nanometer pinnacle rich processors were basically released on a tweaked process. A process that was geared towards mobile applications. It was impressive they were able to even push 4 plus gigahertz on the top end chips. But this time around, since Global Foundry's backed out, they're using a high powered node from TSMC. This is why I believe seeing higher core count CPUs on AM4 is possible. One of the things we learned was that, you guys remember that CES demo where they had a Ryzen 3000 engineering sample going head to head against the 9900K, and we saw it using less power, about 30% or so? Lisa, however, didn't mention that the engineering sample had been intentionally power restricted by approximately 30-40%. to 40%. They had said that they had a lot of headroom left, but it just goes to show, despite the processor being held back, it was able to edge out the 9900K that was left unrestricted. In their questions and answers session, it was brought up that the first gen and second generation processors were pretty disappointing for enthusiasts who were looking to overclock, and this is something that also disappointed me as well. AMD had also mentioned that this was going to be addressed and that 7 nanometers will allow for higher clocks. With the first gen processors, a ceiling had to be put in place since it was a new architecture built from the ground up to ensure stability. When XFR was first introduced, the description we were given made it seem like it was going to be a great alternative for users who don't overclock. Basically a dynamic auto overclock feature that relies on the cooling solution and power delivery which will boost cores accordingly. Unfortunately it didn't really turn out like that. My 1800X on stock settings would only boost like 1 to 2 cores on 4.1 GHz very rarely and usually there was a fast a sharp decline. It couldn't really hold or sustain that frequency for an extended period of time. And I have that CPU cooled by NHD15 in a Corsair Air 740 case so cooling was a non-issue. With the 2000 series processors, they definitely refined it to a much better state, and in some cases, overclocking would regress single core performance over what XFR2 and Precision Boost Overdrive could give you. Therefore, with 7 nanometers and the newer X570 chipsets, I'm sure we'll be seeing dr some dramatic improvements, whether you're an enthusiast who wants to manually overclock or rely on XFR3 and PBO2. But that's all the information that I have for you guys. I'm sure we'll be seeing more information, leaks, and rumors roll out as we get closer to launch. I, for one, am very excited for the 3000 series processors and am really looking forward to how they turn out. If you guys enjoyed the video and found it to be informative, leave a like. Let me know your thoughts down below. Check out the video description for my other videos and ways to support the channel. And if you're interested in more content like this, then make sure you're subscribed. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.